Where were we? Prayers. Okay, so you, you, you will notice you will notice that here we only sing scripture. And there's one or two songs that we have that are loosely based, and I don't even like those. I wanted them out of the line for a long time. <laughs> even though they're loosely based on scripture, they don't, they're not word for word. Okay. And so as we get new songs, we're gonna, we're gonna phase out a little bit. Uh, and there's a reason for that. And, and, and the the reason is is we want everything to come off our lips to be sanctified. The only way we can guarantee that it's sanctified is by that it came out of the mouth of Yahweh. Okay, so um, so we sing the songs. We sing songs that are in the scriptures. And there's many of them. Tim's Tim's song. Uh, you might really really love it, and, and you know, and let me think of the name of it. You probably know which one I'm talking about. Everybody loves it. There's two that he wrote that everybody loves. Uh, and this one is my favorite that he wrote. He wrote, I think, three songs that we did. Uh, it's a song of Moses from Exodus 15. We're going to sing it today. All right, and all of it is straight out of the scriptures. Okay, and, and it may not sound like it, but it is. Um, we did both Hebrew and English there. So, prayer is. Uh, <clears throat> there's a lot to say about it, and I don't know if we can cover it all today, but. Uh, as I stated when we started, it's not something that's commanded, but it is, it is customary. And we talked about this last week. Customs can have the force of law. Did we talk about that? It, can, it, it is so strong in a community that everybody is expected to do it. That's what a custom is. Okay? And so in this body, we expect people to pray. When they don't, it's disappointing. When, you're not, when I hear that you're not doing the daily prayers, it's disappointing. Why? Because you're dead, you're dead weight on the body. If you're not doing the daily prayers, if you're not fighting the battle with us, you're just riding the herd. You know, you just, you just, you know, dragging everybody down. So uh, we try to encourage everybody to do the daily prayers in some measure. That doesn't mean, you know, and in our school, the daily prayers are pretty lengthy. Well, I don't do them three times a day. I do... Most of them in the morning, some of them in the afternoon, and some of them again at night. On, on, when I have time, I do every one of them. Okay? But the idea is that everyone is doing the custom of praying three times daily. And so where does that come from? Okay, it comes from Daniel, but Daniel didn't originate it. Okay? David said, morning and noon and night I pray... Cry out to Yahweh. And that's in Psalm 51 or 52, somewhere along there, maybe 50. It's in the early 50s where he says, Morning, noon, and night, I pray and I cry out daily. Uh, but before that, you see Abraham praying, you see Yitzhak praying, and you see Yaakov praying. And the custom is, is that Abraham prayed in the morning, Yitzhak at noon, and Yaakov at night, or in the evening. Okay? And so the thought is, is that David picked up on that, and he wrote it in the Psalm. And then when Ezra established, when he, because they, by the, after David, they got scattered to Babylon. And when Ezra came back from Babylon and established Jerusalem again and built the temple, he reestablished, and it's in, it's in Ezra chapter 2, I believe. He reestablished the worship of David, the Tehillim of David, the Psalms of David as the body of worship in the Beit HaMikdash. So, that, so there were certain Psalms that they did every day. In the Beit HaMikdash, there were songs that they did approaching the Beit HaMikdash. There were songs that they did during certain feasts. At, uh, like, like right now, during Teshuvah, we're doing Psalm 27. That was done in the Beit HaMikdash as well. Um, so <clears throat> he reestablished those prayers, and the concept was morning, noon, and night. Well, Daniel, you see it. I, I can't remember what chapter it's in. Uh, I want to say it's in chapter 6, I believe. Uh, where it says he prayed three times every day facing Jerusalem. And that's a part that we have to talk about. This sanctuary happens to pretty much, it's off by about a degree. But our sanctuary here pretty much faces Jerusalem because Jerusalem is due east of here. Now, we, we have some people who misunderstood us that we're facing east. That it, that's our desire is to face east. That's not it. Our desire is to face Jerusalem. So if we were in Chicago, we would turn about 25 degrees so that we were facing Jerusalem. And if we were in London, we'd turn again and face Jerusalem. And if we were in 
Baghdad or, or Babylon like Daniel was, we, we turn again and face Jerusalem. So it's not about facing east. Everybody understand that? But it just so happens that we're on a direct eastern parallel with Jerusalem from here, so we don't really have to turn. <laughs> so we're facing forward. Now, I, you'll notice when I do the prayers, especially when we're, because I have to face you guys when we're doing it, but when we do the Torah ceremony, you'll notice that I'm slightly turned about one level off, okay? Because that's actually, you'll see the sun hitting that corner of the sanctuary when it's going down, and that's the opposite. So east is actually one degree off to the left a little bit. Um, but, you know, over 5,000 miles, that doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> if you have an iPad or something, you can get what's called this rock. Yeah. And you can literally put your location, and it, and it will, and you can hold it, and it will point you. Point you to the left direction. Yeah. 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 I have a numbers on my phone. That's how I figured it out. Out here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it's not. Again, it's not about facing east. It's about facing Jerusalem. And so Daniel faced Jerusalem. Why did he do that? And this is not on the customs page. I may, need to, I may need to modify the customs page about prayer. It's King Solomon's prayer. King Solomon prayed that whenever the Jews get scattered, whenever they disobey you, like Moses predicted in our Parsha this week, he predicted that they would disobey. And Solomon knew that they would because Moses said that they would. And so he says, whenever that happens, let them face this city, face the, the Bay of Megdash. Let them face this city. And that's where you hear Solomon say, which Christians quote it all the time, if my people should humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. You know, they forget that part. But uh, Solomon, when he commissioned the temple, when they sanctified it, and when the worship started and the kavod, the glory of Yahweh, hovered over the temple, that's when he prayed, when they get scattered into all the lands, if they should turn and face this spot, face this building, hear their prayers. Okay, so that's another reason that we do it. It's in the hope of having the, the basement of Josh rebuilt. And of course, for us, if we get that built, then anti-Messiah comes because Messiah is about to come back. So we want that house built. Okay, so there's a reason why we face it. So, so it's in honor of that. And if you go, are you scrolling down? Scroll down to the prayer section there, David. <coughs> yeah. And if you'll go on down, you'll see that it details, it just kind of explains some of the major prayers that we do. And I'm not going to go through that today, but you can look at that. Um, I will, are there any questions about any of the <coughs> prayers that we do? Is there one that we do that you don't understand why we're doing it? Why are we saying that prayer? Um, is there any that you just don't understand? Um, you can go in and review those uh, if you want to. <coughs> Okay, so now let's, uh, you can scroll on down to Kippa if you want. So we've talked about the Talit. We've talked about prayer. The Talit is for prayer. We've talked about prayer. Well, the Kippa we talked about a little bit last week. Uh, and we probably need a stronger write-up on this. Uh, Kippa comes from the same word as Kippur, which means atonement or covering. Okay? Um, yes, it's called a yarmulke. That's just a Yiddish word. Um, we're not Yiddish, so we don't <laughs> use that one. Um, I think we covered this last week. Is, does anybody have questions about it? It's, it's also really not a commandment. It's probably the newest custom. Well, it's not new in the sense that they've always worn a head covering, but this particular style is new compared to the age of Judaism, yes. I mean, they, came to, they started wearing this exactly like this probably about three or 400 years ago. Um, and the size of it has changed. You know, Kelly's wearing one that goes all the way back to the Middle East in the, the ancient days. Okay, so in, in all likelihood, Yeshua wore something like that. Uh, so, and it does become a little bit of a matter of fashion. 
I mean, it's a, de it's a decoration in some sense. Uh, but <clears throat> it's representative. The reason it's called a kippa is because it's representative of, of Elohim being our covering. Okay, and so there's a lot of places in the Psalms where it talks about he covers me. He, he, his shadow is over me. He is, you know, he rules over me. So it's the concept of being submitted to Elohim. And uh, we talked about it at length last week because of the question about 1 Corinthians 11, and that deals with hair. Did anybody go back and see what I was talking about in those, looking at those two verses, setting in context, kind of the bookends of that passage? In 1 Corinthians 11, verses 2 and verse 14, they actually kind of bookend it with hair. Okay? Um, <clears throat> but the priest is commanded to wear a head covering when he ministers. All right? And so the custom is, is that men, Jewish men, have always had their head covered in the sense of having a something, some kind of apparel on their head when they pray. The tallit has become that. But the, the idea of wearing a cover all the time goes all the way back into pre-Babylonian days, all the way back to the time of Isaiah. So uh, the, the notion of having a, your head covered when you pray is a very strong ancient custom. Well, Daniel, to me it seems that we're supposed to be a, a priesthood at this point in time. And I find myself, uh, especially since I've started wearing the, the zitio, um, that uh, people ask me about it. Well, as soon as somebody asks me about that, then I am going to minister to them on, pretty much automatically. So therefore, I pretty much go and wear in this full time, which draws just as much attention, if not more, at any rate. And therefore, I'm kind of covering myself by covering my head when I'm ministering to someone else. But somehow, that, it keeps me in check. Um, it does keep you in check. I, I wear my keep that everywhere, and you can always feel it. You always know it's there. And it's kind of like, and you're going to hear that in my message today. One of the things that we have to be mindful of always is that Yahweh is with us. Okay? And, and it, it certainly doesn't hurt to have a physical reminder that He's with you, that He's over you, that He's your guide, He's, your, he's, he's the one moving you through life. So, um, again, it is a custom, but it is a strong one. It's not directly commanded. However, it is directly commanded from priesthood. The high priest, I wish... Uh, You'll see it. You'll see uh, Ray uh, here in a few minutes, and you'll see he's wearing the actual uh, uh, sort of a mock-up of the, of the, the head covering the, the uh, turban of the high priest. It has Kadosh Layawa on it, okay? Um, that's what the high priest wore. And then all the other priests also wore a smaller, it's called a miter, I believe, in English, a smaller head covering. So the whole priesthood wore a head covering while they minister. Okay? Uh, so that is the idea behind it, is we are the priesthood. That's in uh, Peter. He calls us a royal priesthood. What you got, Mark? Uh, I'm wondering if there needs to be something else differentiated a little bit in the, like the general actions, though, because okay. keep it alone, I've actually had a group think I was a Muslim because of the keep it's just their ignorance. So. No, I understand that, but <laughs> see that. It, 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 but I guess my point on that is, it, it does. The dress alone doesn't matter. There also has to be some product of the dress that backs it up. If one is I'm going to start doning that sort of thing, I'm not understanding what you're saying. There's a real fine line between how the two groups act between Jewish and Muslim when it comes to how they walk their faith. There, there are so many similarities because they do have similar roots. Uh, well, it's so, not just because they have similar roots, it's because they are a fraud well, meant to look like the truth. So I they get that. Things of truth and put them in their religion right. and wrap them in a fraudulent. No, I get that. The rest of the world, I don't think. I think I understand does. what you're saying. Our behavior, it, yeah. just wearing a keeper is not doing anything exactly. for you. It's, exactly. It's, it's helping you if you are mindful of why you're doing it. Right. Instead of just, I'm, I want to look cool and be Jewish. If you're mindful of why you're doing it, then it does help you. Right. If, if all you're doing is slapping a keeper on for the sake of wearing a keeper, then it's, it, there's no sense in doing it. But even in my explanation of why I do, you know, I, I, can't, I, I, I lean towards the side of, of Jewishness because I understand and I explain that's what God chose. So it's good for me too. But even beyond that, 
uh, it, it's also something that I have to take on as a recognition of Messiah over me, not just because it's a, a cultural thing. And that's where I, I think, in, like the way he was talking about, about witnessing, you know, that I can kind of lead that into the whole idea about what, what's the difference between being a Jewish person and being a Messianic believer and the covering of God over me. And I can kind of swing into that because of the dress and use it as that, that witness. And 
and so they would they you know they didn't have cell phones hanging off their pockets back then to distract them all the time. They didn't have a television sitting in their house <coughs> to steal their time away while they were sitting at home. They pursued the word of Elohim and they memorized things. Okay? Well, they were commanded to speak at it when they rose, when they went about their business. Mm -hmm. and when you lie down, when you rise up, when you sit in your house, and when you walk on the way. And that's what they talked about. And that's what they did. They had the G-pad so up here. Huh? They had the G-pad up here. That's right. <laughs> the Yah-pad. The Yah-pad. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's, let's copyright that. <laughs> so they memorized them. And so I believe that when the disciples, the Talmudim walked up to Yeshua one day, and, and, and the way it reads is, teach us to pray. I believe they said, teach us a prayer. I haven't checked it yet in Aramaic to see how, but what does he do? He teaches them a prayer. And I believe that it's basically an abridged version of what was already one of the prayers, one of the lengthy set of prayers that you have in your Siddur. It's called the Amidah. It's 18 benedictions. All right? That was already in, in circulation, if you will, back in Messiah's day, but not written down. It wasn't formalized and written down yet. It's something that they customarily did, that they would teach to each other, and that was the one, the Amidah means the standing prayer. So in the midday at noon, they would stand to pray. And they would, if they were outside of Yerushalayim, they would likely face Yerushalayim and say the Amidah at midday. All right, well, Yeshua's disciples... You know, we know that we know that they were all working class people, right? Fishermen, tax collectors. We had one doctor. He wasn't an apostle though, but he was following them around. Uh, do we know the occupation? We had three fishermen at least. Well, actually, when we came with Peter and John and James, they were all in, in the one village and that Saida, so they were probably all fishermen. In all likelihood, most of them were, but we know that Matthew was a tax collector. So they were they were working class people that had jobs, right? Uh, and so I believe that they were saying, you know, maybe they had trouble memorizing the Amidah. I haven't memorized it yet, and I've been praying it for years. Okay? <coughs> However, the prayer that Yeshua taught the Talmudim, I got it memorized in Hebrew and in Hebrew. I could probably do it in French. Um, but because it's, it's Greek, but what did he do? He taught them, basically, I believe, an abridged version, a shortened version of the Amidah, because it covers almost all the same elements. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, but I guess the point being is that he taught them a prayer, and he said, when you pray, say it. Now, I was taught as a Baptist that you're not supposed to say repetitious prayers, you know, so we would, we rarely in our Baptist church ever said the Lord's Prayer because it was wrong to say vain repetitions. The key word in that statement that Yeshua said is vain. All right? Again, if all you're doing is standing there saying the words, then yeah, you're just, you're just burning the clock. But if you are prayerful, if you are intent and your heart is in it, then there's nothing wrong with it because he said, when you pray, say. Okay? Uh, so, and I believe also that his saying, when you pray, means you're going to be praying three times a day. And so when you do, say this. So, the disciples' prayer is part of my regimen every time I pray. You get my point? Okay. So these prayers were put in a siddur because it's impossible to memorize them. But you'll find out, many of you can probably quote most of what we do. The ones we do every week, and there's a few that we do every week, you can probably quote them because you hear them every week, right? And you hear them every day because you're saying them yourself, right? Try. Can't wait till we start singing the yuck it all.
Yeah. 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 How, how about where the line started being divisioned between what it, the basic stuff that would have already been known, these things that you've known since your youth, and where he started harking on the Pharisees? That would be a nice gray area to differentiate between messianic and basic. Well, Just a suggestion. I guess my point is, is that I don't want to just read to you. Mm -hmm. Something that you can read on your own. Right. Um, the other stories that we have are barring by the instant of mezuzah, brief the law, weddings, Sabbath, in the home. I've actually been pretty curious about the wedding thing. Like, I don't understand all the time. I understand this symbolism and it's all wrapped up in scripture. I don't understand, like, the woman walking around the man three times. Seven, seven times. 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 The not Saul and catching away the bride. Mm -hmm. um, and Yeshua used the wedding in his parables several times. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, I'll say this Jews, Jewish people, were put here for the purpose of declaring Messiah. And all their customs declare him, even ones that they created after Messiah that they thought would hide Messiah from the rest of the world. Spooky. And so one of them is at Passover, but I'll, I'll, I'll go over it briefly, but you'll see it at the Passover. And you probably already know because you've been to Passover before, but there's a tradition called the Afikomen, which was created later on. And it's a beautiful picture of Messiah coming out of the Father and going and being buried and hidden and then going and being raised from the dead and found and brought back and giving a gift, okay? The wedding is the same way. The customs that we do at a wedding evolve much later, even though the root of them is in the first century. And so a first century wedding, and we talked about this on Thursday night to some degree, I think, uh, and I think two Thursday nights ago we did as well. But the wedding is... A picture of, and the whole reason that Yahweh created the husband and the wife is to show our relationship to him. Because that's how close he wants to be with us. And so we're his bride. So in the first century, a father would, uh, if, if there was a young man who pursued his daughter, then he would have to bring in Ketuba. Yeah, that's... And that's called the writing. All right? And that's a picture of the Torah. Okay, so... The son brings this ketubah to the father and he says, this is, this is my agreement. If you will allow me to take your daughter as my bride, this is, this is how we're going to do things. This is how our life is going to be. This is my agreement. This is what I'm going to give you. And, and uh, there's an exchange that is made. And so if they agree to that, then uh, they seal that contract in a cup of wine. The father and the, the groom uh, partake of a cup of wine. Okay, and that's the agreement. Okay, you can have my daughter, but you have to do thus and such, you know, and part of that is build her a house. I'm not going to turn, you know, I don't want you to be a vagabond and go, you know, have her over, under the other pass over there, you know. A <laughs> <laughs> house. So, so he goes away to build a house, all right? She takes the ketubah and Sorry. makes sure that she's ready. She gets everything done in the ketubah that has to be done before their marriage. And it's all in the ketubah. Now today the ketubah is basically kind of condensed. But back then it had it was a legal contract. It wasn't symbolic back then. It was a legal contract. That's why they had to have time to read it. That's right. So she, she took the time to study the contract to make sure that she was going to adhere to it. And he would go away and build the house. And while he's building the house, if anyone came to now, you've got to picture this, okay? So he's building a house. But when you're building a house and you've just poured the slab, you, Ain't nobody going to ask you when you get married because you ain't even got a house. <laughs> right? 
If it's framed up, it's like, okay, getting close. You know? You start putting, you know, walls on the inside of it and finishing it off on the inside and a roof on the top, then you really know it's getting close. And then people start asking, when you get married, what does he say? I don't know. Only my father can tell me. And that's what Yeshua said about his return. Only my father knows. Okay, so it's the father of the groom that determines when the house is ready. Okay? So, uh, when it is ready, then his father says, okay, you can go get her. And she doesn't know it. But she knows the house is almost ready. You know, she probably goes by it every day. <laughs> couple things. Uh, first, the sheets, those were not washed. They were retained as evidence, in my understanding. Yeah, yeah. And if we're the bride, who are the bridesmaids? Huh? Who are the bridesmaids filled with the Holy Spirit? The oil. All of them represent the bride. They all represent the bride. So the group, bride and bridesmaids, are coming into... Yeah. Be, but there's only one bride. We're supposed to be the bride of Messiah, so... Hang on. There is a place where... Earthly reality and heavenly symbolism have a divide. Right. Okay. Earthly, there are bridesmaids who don't go into the bread bed chamber with her. But heavenly, it's it, the reason there's more than one is because we are we are more than one, but we are a singular bride. So therein lies that whole thing about the 144 and then a number behind them that couldn't be counted. Maybe that's no, that separation. Let's not get into that here. That's not that's okay. 144 has nothing to do with pride. 
That has nothing to do with the bride. Okay. But, well, I was remembering the ones outside, the ones that couldn't be counted, the maybe. The ones who weren't ready could not be could not come into the wedding, and mm-hmm. they tried to get into the banquet later, and they were even rejected from that. Oh, that's I true. That's the group of people we talked about on Thursday night. Yeah. Who know Messiah, but don't follow him. And who say, I'll take care of it in the tribulation if I have to go through it. They will be deceived. Elohim will force them to believe the lie. Mm -hmm. And they won't get into the wedding nor the banquet. Which gets back to the fact that there's a seven year tribulation. The wedding happens at the beginning of it. By the next all, we go up into the upstairs where Yeshua said he went away to prepare a house for us. Right? Mm -hmm. Right. I go to prepare a place for you. That's wedding terminology. So he has been up there. He doesn't, you know, he's a carpenter, but heaven doesn't need hammer and saw. What he's talking about is he's preparing us. We're his edifice. We're his building. And we're supposed to have time to read his tuba. That's right. So it's all linked together. Do you see why mm-hmm. it's symbolic? The earthly wedding was symbolic of things. Mm-hmm. Okay, but he's been building his house by building us. Are you with me? Right. Mm-hmm. Okay. Right. So. When he calls us up there, and the house is prepared and it's ready, and, and the wedding is consummated, and we become priests, he gives us a crown. What's going on down here is all of this nighttime stuff, mm-hmm. bad stuff, evil stuff. That's why it's done at night. That's why the wedding happens at night, is to, to, because there's bliss in the, in the chamber of the bride and the groom. But out, outside of that, there's night, and night represents evil. In the scriptures, anytime you're reading about nighttime, it's evil. Okay, so uh, all of that evil stuff is going on down here. It's at the end of the seven days where they have a banquet, and all it see the only people that are coming to the house thing are the intimate ones. Their family and their dearest friends are coming to the house, but afterward they throw a banquet, and the whole town comes. Okay, everybody comes. Well, that's when Messiah comes back with his bride. And Revelation 19 says very clearly there's a whole bunch of people on white horses right behind him. And they're not angels. So who are they? It's us. And so we come with him and we rule over the people who come to the banquet. And the ones who thought they were coming to the wedding but weren't ready don't even get to go to that. That's scary. Yeah. There's also a scripture in the Bible about the little circle of the mansions. And I can't, I'm trying to find it. I can't find it. Um, this says, shall, shall a woman surround a man? And again, it's that, it's that picture of the woman surrounding the man. Yeah. It was interesting. I was talking to a, a person who's not calling for and we were reading some stuff together, and all of a sudden it came there. And I'd never seen that scripture before, but I knew what it was, you know, because I'm following it. <coughs> So, uh, Will, is that everything that you have a question? Yeah, yeah, well, because that was the basic thing, like the hookah and, and, and the, the frog, the woman around the woman, and I get it, you know, I mean, we're convincing, and we're condensing, and it's still symbolic of what was the reality, physical reality back then. Because I understood the bride chamber stuff, and, and then the, the father letting you know when the house is ready, so I just didn't understand the actual custom to have these days. Okay, so we sign a ketuba, and we do the... We, we're taking the wine right there. Usually that's done ahead of time, but we do it in the wedding ceremony. See, there's, in Judaism, there's a betrothal ceremony, which we don't do typically because you guys decide on your own who you're going to marry, and you don't go to mom and dad. You know? uh, it would be interesting to see our kids begin to do that, you know, to go through a betrothal, you know, to keep them from doing things they shouldn't be doing. You know, um, And then... Uh, the trip around the hookah is probably, or the trip around the bridegroom is probably the most unusual. Uh, so, what do you guys want to do with this class over the next few weeks? Then? Hey, Daniel, mm-hmm. maybe go into some specifics about when you posted up that we're Mishnahic instead of rabbinic. That might be something that. I do think we need to cover that because that seems to be a perpetual question. That's what I was talking about. And, uh, so why we do Passover, when we do it, yeah. why we do Yom Kippur, when we do it. It would be helpful for us to, to I would hate to use the term arm myself, but because that's one of my jolly runs, but when those okay. questions come out, we can be forward. Okay. We, we cut
covered that in brief on Thursday night, I think. Real briefly. Mm -hmm. but, I found a tour of calendar.com and it explained all that where they see the menu. And it was exactly where we were. It was really exciting. I just found it last week. And you could put it in there and see when they would see the new menu right at the Temple Mount when it was possible. And it was exactly when we were doing things. Excellent. I love it. It's great. <laughs> so, yeah, we'll, we'll go over 